Revolutionary greetings uh, to everybody, the people of South Africa, fighters, commissars. Welcome to the EFF podcast. Today is the second part of our discussion with the Deputy President of the EFF, Commissar Floyd Nyikoshiwambo. We are discussing the 2024 elections manifesto, a 260-pages document which contains programs and commitments of the EFF post-29 May. Don't forget to vote the EFF. Deputy President, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Commissar Mwizini, and uh, it's uh, great that we continue with these very important conversations so that we illuminate the entirety of society to mm -hmm. have a far much better <clears throat> apprehension and understanding of just what does the EFF stand for and how are we going to constitute government and how are we going to deal with all the necessary uh, demands that come with being government mm -hmm. uh, from the 29th of May onwards. So we have to, from time to time, uh, make these reflections. Well, let's delve right into it. One <coughs> of the big questions relates to 260 pages of programs and commitments. And commitments yes. How is the EFF going to fund its manifesto? Look, we're going to speak to the details of just how the manifesto is going to be funded, mm -hmm. uh, each and every aspect. We're actually going to speak to the five broad categories of where the money is going mm -hmm. to come from to finance the entire manifesto. But at the core level of what we are going to explain is that we're going to utilize the political power which we're contesting for now mm -hmm to use fiscal and monetary policy to drive industrialization and economic growth so that the base upon which you collect revenue or like taxes for the state is far much more widened because a government primarily relies on taxes uh, for the expenditure, for the budget that it utilizes to meet social obligations, to drive economic growth, to guarantee safety and security, and a variety of other of its obligations. So we are going to meaningfully utilize fiscal policy and monetary policy to respond to the demands of our people. So that is basically what we're going to then deal with. But I'm going to speak in detail later yeah. on as to what are the key components no, of that's... fiscal policy which we're going to then deal with. Yes. There is a chapter on fiscal and monetary policy for the benefit yes, in... of our... It's chapter 27 of the 33 chapters, yes. For the benefit of our listeners and viewers... Uh, what is monetary and fiscal policy? So actually, both fiscal and monetary policy falls within the broad framework of macroeconomics. Mm -hmm. so, like, so the difference between macroeconomics is the ones, the macroeconomics are the ones that deals with fiscal and monetary policy. I'm going to explain what that is now. Mm -hmm. And microeconomics speaks to the issues of industrial policy and what. Mm -hmm a trade and industry department or an economic development department would do. But in terms of fiscal policy, it speaks to the role that the government has to play in a revenue collection and government expenditure. So the issue of budgeting as to where do you dedicate most of your resources in, in infrastructure and in, in social development or social mm -hmm. protection and healthcare education, so that is the fiscal policy. So fiscal policy plays a very important role in driving economic growth because it's literally the money which a government injects into society uh, with the hope that such is going to generate uh, more uh, economic activities. So that is basically the summary of it that is about revenue collection and government expenditure is fiscal policy. Monetary policy speaks to the supply of money. Mm -hmm and the protection of the value of the currency. The, cu the currency will be the rand in the case of South Africa. Uh, so the, the, the primary instrument uh, uh, that uh, protects or, the, or deals with the supplier of money and protects the, the currency is the central bank, which is the South African Reserve Bank in the case of South Africa. Mm -hmm. Actually, Section 224 of South Africa's constitution says that the South African Reserve Bank is mandated with protection of the value of the currency with the aim of uh, promoting economic growth and development. That is basically the distinction between monetary and fiscal policy. So government is solely and primarily responsible for 
driving fiscal policy as to just where do we expand the now more than two trillion rands budget. So that is collected. Yes, it's, 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 it's collected. Yes. DP. Um, before we go into the detail of how the EFF will use the budget uh, and how it is going to collect taxes or revenue or expand revenue, what has been the South Af- or South Africa's fiscal policy over the last 30 years? And if you could give us a diagnosis uh, in relation to its own objectives, but also in these objective, in the general objective of uplifting the living conditions of our people? Look, the general diagnosis of how fiscal and monetary policy have been utilized in South Africa since 1994 is that they have dismally failed, and that is illustrated in the consequences of the socio-economic conditions of our people, mm-hmm. generally even with economic measurements. Because the average growth of South Africa since 1994 has never exceeded 2%. Mm. And we always highlight the fact that in the past 12 years, like from 2012 uh, to now 2024, Mm. the average growth is Mm 0.8%. The director, the sitting director general, I hope he's outgoing as well, Mm -hmm. of the National Treasury makes that remark in the 2024-2025 budget a full budget statement that uh, we we have had an average of 0.8 uh, economic growth for the past 12 years and that the debt service costs have risen because the debt to GDP ratio, like the money which government owes uh, different financial institutions domestically and globally mm-hmm. has increased to the extent that we have, as South Africa's biggest expenditure item, we have debt service cost. Like this is the money which we are repaying back to the international financial institutions and domestic financial institutions. Where we borrowed money. Yeah, where we borrowed money. And that is like 383 billion. Mm-hmm. With 383 billion, you can do a lot of money. Because, I mean, like if you look into that, the next item on the expenditure item will be basic education. It's smaller than what we pay for a the the debt service cost mm. and the budget which is allocated to basic education pays all the teachers, takes care of all the schools, stationary. So you can imagine what 380 billion can do to shift the, the life of our people for the better, but to also stimulate economic activity. So, but currently, in the manner in which fiscal policy has been utilized as an instrument of growth, has not been very impactful. What percentage it is, should, it, is it the shows, debt? So we are currently at 70% that the debt GDP, GDP ratio mm-hmm. it's at 70%. So we we owe about um, 5 trillion rands mm-hmm. for an economy which is just above or just above 7 trillion rand mm-hmm. in terms of GDP measurements. Mm-hmm. So that is 70% in terms of uh, the current calculation that the the money which the South African government owes to financial institution is equals to 70% of its uh, overall growth domestic product, which is the measure Mm -hmm. of all economic activities that take place in a given uh, annual basis. Mm -hmm. That, uh, just a bit of detail there. So um, the EFF plans to use a fiscal policy to fund its programs. Yes. Yet, what you've just described is Why a dim crisis? view. Uh, our GDP, our debt to GDP ratio is at 70%. Uh, our expenditure item, the largest expenditure item on our budget, is to pay the debts. Uh, so, if the fiscal status of South Africa is so dramatically uh, in crisis, shouldn't we fix it first? Where are you going to get the money? Because what so, you've just said is that yeah. we don't have the money yeah. for so the types the, of programs that we are planning yeah. to implement. So there are there are different <coughs> mechanisms which we're going to speak to now mm-hmm. in terms of how you deal with a huge deficit, but also to expand the revenue of the state. Mm-hmm. The obvious one is that you must develop the productive forces. Mm-hmm. So in... The mainstream language, they say it's, it must grow the economy. It's economic growth. Like, But I want to emphasize on 
are referring to economic growth as development of the productive forces mm -hmm. because sometimes economic growth can just sometimes even refer to the nominal increase in the value of uh, the economy without a real productive sector expanding. Mm -hmm. Like there was a time when South Africa's economy grew due to the increase in the prices of natural resources of commodities mm -hmm. without really creating additional jobs or without like building additional infrastructure, without doing anything productive. Mm -hmm. So at the base of how you want to increase your revenue, you must grow the economy, you must develop the productive forces in a much mm -hmm. more meaningful way. In that way, you then expand the base upon which you are going to collect the revenue, which are taxes for uh, developmental purposes, for purposes that are going to be utilized by government and the state. So that is basically the essence of what uh, is, is required. Now, what do we do in the immediate is that the South African government is not optimally collecting revenue from particularly the corporate sector. Like So there's basically three major divisions of taxes which are the sources of South Africa's revenue. One is personal income tax, mm -hmm. which is the amounts of money which people who are employed are paying to government on an annual basis, like mm -hmm. the, the, the tax returns which we submit to SARS and, and we get charged a certain amount of money. And currently, the... Personal income tax is the biggest contribution to South Africa's government revenue, like budget, mm -hmm. at uh, about 740 billion rands. Mm -hmm. And then the second component is a uh, corporate income tax, which is about 302 billion. So all the companies combined. Yeah, combined are obliged to pay taxes out of their profits. So, you know, once you have made profit as a company, mm -hmm you must then pay taxes out of the profit that you have made. So if you have break, you have, you've got a break even, you know, you've made a loss, you do not uh, pay any tax. I'll explain what is the importance of highlighting that aspect. And then the other aspect, the other contribution to <clears throat> our revenue or the tax base is the value-added tax. So a lot of products in South Africa, not all of them have got VAT so when you buy in a restaurant you, or in a, a major retail mm -hmm. chain stores, you will see at the bottom of the slip there that there's VAT, which is 15% currently. Mm -hmm. So all that VAT is collected, and then the companies that have traded or sold or retailed products take all that money into the National Revenue Fund, which is the budget mm -hmm. of the state in terms of um, what happens. We then highlight something very important that... As things stand, the South African government is not optimally mm -hmm. is not optimally collecting revenue from the companies, particularly in the natural resources sector, which are operating in South Africa. I did highlight that taxes are collected from profits. Mm. So these companies which are supposed to be making profits here in South Africa, they are engaged in something called profit shifting. Mm -hmm. So they shift the profits to the tax havens, uh, not heaven. Like there's a difference between tax haven and heaven. So it's mm -hmm. tax havens, which are areas where they claim that they actually blow to the expenses of their company. They say that we've got consulting services and mm -hmm. marketing services uh, from a company which is in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. Bermuda is a small island somewhere uh, in the Caribbean or uh, Virgin Islands, Atlantic Virgin Islands, or, or even London, by the way, like they shift Dubai. a lot of profits. Yeah, Dubai as well. Uh, then they, they shift profits so that they do not pay taxes in South Africa. So there is huge tax leakages that uh, are happening in South Africa. We have raised this several times in Parliament. Under the broad framework of illicit financial flows, tax-based erosion and profit, profit shifting. shifting. Yeah, so tax-based erosion basically means that that when you shift profits to mm. outside South Africa, you're eroding the base upon which government, uh, government collects collect revenue. So and that is one thing which we're going to decisively deal with. And by the way, just to highlight this, is that we have draft legislation which we had far much more in-depth consultations with experts, but also with the parliamentary legal office and everyone else involved. 
then we realize that the the non cooperation of the the institutions which must implement that uh, legislation. that legislation will render it mute altogether. So if we had insisted to just pass the legislation on anti-tax avoidance and, and anti-profit shifting legislation, they were just going to sit on top of it and not do anything about it and still we continue to have the leakages. Our estimation is that if we maximally and optimally collect all the revenue that is due to the state, we can collect double what is being collected from the companies currently. Eight trillion. We can, we can, we can, we can, we can. At the moment, we're at yes. two trillion. Yeah, currently so we're at four trillion. trillion. Yes, actually, okay. the first sentence mm -hmm. in the fiscal and monetary framework chapter says that we are going to aim towards doubling the revenue which the mm -hmm. state collects because we think that the leakages are way too much. Let, let, let's in be terms a bit of how it happens. detailed, deep yes. on that point. Uh, it's a bold statement. Yes, it uh, obviously requires these instruments that are not available to. South Africa's legislative framework as yet. Yes. So they will have to be passed yes. on one hand. But the institutions, SARS and Actually, other people. Yeah. So can you just take us through the detail? What is maximal collection of taxes that will lead to a, is it 100% increase? 100% increase. Yes. So, so the, you know, the instruments which we actually mention in the draft legislation on anti-tax avoidance is that you need a full cooperation. or actually even in, 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 uh, propose an, a structure or an institution which will be comprised of the South African Reserve Bank because it is the one that regulates the movement of money. Mm -hmm. It includes the Financial Intelligence Center, mm -hmm. which has is, is got proper legis legislated access to all money it's that is generated. Yeah? It's very weak. No, it, it has got potential to could be positioned far much more That's better. That's true. The Financial Intelligence Center and then SARS, but also a division that uh, deals with commercial crimes as well. So that there is a far much firmer uh, attention to just how do we collect the revenue. I can give you a simple example, by the way, that there is thousands of mines here in South Africa. Thousands of Mines which are like taking minerals out of South Africa to different destinations. But I'll give you an example of just two mines. Like one is Lonmin. Lonmin had shifted 2.5 billion rand, which was supposed to be part of the revenue of South Africa to mm. Bermuda. It's in the Fallon Commission report, which was investigating the Marikana massacre, which was caused and influenced by Sarah Ramaphosa and the ANC in protection of private capitalist interest. Mm. And the other one is Anglo-American, by the way, when, when the high-level panel on illicit financial flows and tax-based erosion, which was commissioned by the African Union, it actually came back to say that upward of 5 billion rands, just two companies, we are talking about 7.5 mm. billion rands. And there is several, many other players in the natural resources sector in South Africa, which are avoiding taxes in South Africa. And I suspect as well that even the so-called black-owned uh, mines. mines are involved in that. And how do you notice that they are avoiding taxes? They always declare losses. Mm. But they continue to operate. Like you find a company with like 30,000 employees, 50,000 employees, but every time in their finances, they say, we've made a loss, we've made a loss, we've made a loss, so that they do not pay any tax. Uh, in terms of what is expected from them. So we need to have a forensic, even retrospective uh, attention to the phenomena of uh, tax-based Retrospective. Regime. Yes, we must go back, we must put a commission of inquiry to look into mm. what historically have been the avoidance cases of taxes which otherwise are back. due. Like how far, but we, must, we must go as far back as 10, 15 years and everything else. I remember we can come that back the... With the uh, we can come back with the... With the actually, we remember the, the letter which we wrote to the head of state and government after the Fallon Commission made that demand that we need yeah. a commission of inquiry mm. into tax avoidance and illicit financial flows. And we, we are, we, it's, it's more than guaranteed that such can be able to to increase revenue in a huge way. That is one one aspect. I must put the next mm. one. No, um, want to stay there. Yeah. The President Mbeki led a a 
AU High Panel uh, Initiative, which actually estimated, as a, if I remember the figures correctly, that over the last 50 years, the continent could have lost at close to one trillion US dollars into illicit financial flows. Yes. And they were they, their marker was about 50, 50 years. It, it seems like a fundamentally important point, not for South Africa only, but also for the economic activities of extractive industries across the continent. Yeah. You know, the, the most painful thing about the African continent and its economic activities is that even outside of the tax avoidance and profit shifting, there's also natural resources theft. Mm. Like in the Democratic Republic of Congo where these major uh, companies, they build lending strips like closer to the mines mm. and of cobalt. Cobalt is utilized to make the electronic products like mm. phones and iPads and laptops. They literally build lending strips and land there and take the minerals and leave the country. In the Niger Delta, in Angola, in Ghana, like they just literally go and park a vessel there, mm. pump crude oil and leave. Mm. So there's not even a record by the hosting counter of the natural resources as to what has left. So this, it's actually even an extreme level of, it's not even tax avoidance. It's mm. pure, pure theft of natural resources such that I know that like when we tried to forge a common perspective in the Pan-African Parliament on how we collectively should deal with tax avoidance. A lot of the our brothers and sisters from the continent were saying that in our countries we're actually experiencing theft mm. of natural resources. Not which are tax not, avoidance. Not even tax avoidance. Here in South Africa, at least to some extent, there is an account mm. of where the mines are because the state is custodian of all mineral resources. We give mining permits we were looking for reports as to what have you produced, what are you taking out of the country. The law actually even permits as to the minister regulating just how much minerals must go out of the country and all of those mm. aspects. How they play South African government is on profit shifting where they just declare I losses. See. But then my, they say uh, that we have not made any profit mm -hmm. out of this. But the amount of leakages, the money which is being lost due to tax-based erosion and illicit financial mm -hmm. flows is far much more substantial. And it only needs a decisive government to could, uh, combat that. And that is what uh, we're going to do when we take over. How government. much do you think uh, I was trying, uh, where I was trying to go is that commission or high panel estimated about a trillion US dollars over 50 years. If you go, you said 15 years or 20 years, just how much estimation-wise do you think upon the resolution of the illicit financial flows problem, how much How much would you raise for South Africa out of that first instrument? You know, I'm, I'm sure that the detail, we might actually even discover more than what we had estimated. I know all the estimations, like desktop estimations, were pointing to upward of $250 billion annually. In South Africa only. In South Africa only, yes. So that is that is the estimation. $250 that billion of annually. Is the money South Africa should, is it in Pol hands? Po potentially, potentially collect should as revenue from, from the corporate uh, sector, particularly in the natural, in the extractive industries. So that is that is that is the number $250 that... $250 billion rents. Yes. That's the first money. Yeah, if which... Which will get and then out of the first instrument. Yes. What is the next instrument? The next instrument um, will have to be to capacitate the local state to optimally mm -hmm. collect revenue. So, the current funding framework or the fiscal framework that allocates revenue or money to or like budgets to local governments and provincial governments. It's premised on the supposition that the local state should collect its own revenue. Mm. But currently, the local state is it's almost perennially incapable of collecting revenue. I think it's less than 20% of municipalities in South Africa that are collecting revenue. Yeah, the it's rest are not. Probably far less. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 Outside so, the major metros. And, and, and what is actually even concerning is that even the metros are not optimally collecting mm. revenue. Like, they, they could do four or five times more than what they are doing now. Like particularly with 
like the large power users for electricity, property rates and water rates and all of those. Mm. And there is a mechanism which we have to institute in the local state in all the municipalities to optimally collect the revenue. So that then gives the national government a far much bigger breathing space to allocate resources to other developmental or industrial projects because you do not need to over-subsidize the local state with literally everything else that they do because they they, they would have um, collected their own revenue uh, optimally. And and the there are so many leakages. Sometimes it's due to lack of proper systems for billing and making sure that whoever is utilizing municipal services, whether it's electricity, water, lights, rubbish collection, pays uh, uh, fully. But the other aspect as well that applies is corruption. I'll mm -hmm. tell you of a metro metropolitan municipality where, retrospectively, a large power user was owing the municipality 345 million, but the municipality went to negotiate with that person to pay 50 million only. Mm. But you can already see that there was an arrangement elsewhere that yeah. will give us the other money on the other side. There. So this, that, that has to be combated. And Why is the local state, I mean, I, I understand that uh, the entire state from the executive up to the local state has a lot of corruption, but it seems from a basic observation of the Auditor General's reports the biggest leakages are at the local stage, at the local state, out yeah. of which corruption activities happen. It, what is the cause of that? And I mean, if you're going to close those leakages of corruption, what would be the immediate things EFF would do? Look, you know, the, uh, there are certain things which have to be handled differently. The, I mean, like you've got a situation where ESCOM, for instance, is owed billions of rents by municipalities. But NSCOM continues to give bulk electricity to municipalities to trade for them. So you give bulk electricity to a M Fulani municipality. Mm -hmm. They sell electricity to people. They get the money fully mm -hmm. because people must pay for electricity and then they don't take it to ESCOM. And, and, and ESCOM doesn't say anything wrong with that. They continues to give them electricity and all of those other things there. I think from... A central coordination point of view, from a responsible government point of view, when we realize that certain politicians and corrupt individuals are playing some dirty games in terms of control of water resources, we must take over those functions. Mm. Like, why do you? Because ESCOM can directly institute the mechanism of selling electricity directly to our people without the municipality being involved if it doesn't bring the money back, because ESCOM has to pay workers has to maintain the power stations, has to make sure that everything else is in place. But if some rascals in the municipality are just taking the money which is supposed to sustain the electricity generation and transmission, it must take over that function decisively and, and, and arrest all the leakages. I don't think that such can even take us more than six months to put into place. Mm -hmm. Because if a municipality has been receiving bulk supply of electricity from ESCOM and it doesn't bring back anything, we must take those functions so that we stabilize the revenue basis. Because part of the, the state guaranteed debt is upward of $400 billion which is owed uh, to ESCOM, like, mm. uh, which, which, is, which ESCOM owes, actually, not this owed to ESCOM, mm. which ESCOM owes financial instruments because they are not in a balanced situation. So we have to act much more firmly Hmm. on how the local state then gets to optimally collect the revenue. That is one of the things that... Local state. To. What is yes. the next instrument? The next instrument is to increase the efficiency and profitability of state-owned companies. You know, when Telcom, which is partially state-owned, mm -hmm. was stable and was like making profit under uh, the CEO, Sipo Maseko. Mm. It used to give the National Revenue Fund upward of 3 billion rands annually. Mm. Just one state-owned company. Out of its own business activities, they will declare their profit and say that because government owes 30% or somewhere there, this is your part of the dividends. Mm. And that contributes to the money which ultimately government 
must they uh, get to. So we have to stabilize all state-owned companies. There's huge potential of what can be done with DINEL mm -hmm. uh, in terms of its productive capacity, profitability as well to contribute to the National uh, Revenue Fund. There's a lot that can be done with Transnet. Leave the domestic operations which are, uh, are, are like now obsessing Transnet. Mm -hmm. Why is not Transnet expanding its rail network to the entire continent? This need for continental integration. Transnet should have open continental infrastructure development program, which is going to end the South African state a lot of revenue mm -hmm. because we need to trade amongst ourselves. Like There's a lot of economic activities that can be catalyzed and be fully realized if we have Transnet deal with work in the entire continent. So that applies to ESCOM as well. Look at, at how these... Um, Countries in the Emirates and in the Middle East, Qatar, uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and all of those, Saudi Arabia, they got to be super rich because of energy. Mm. We can utilize, we can have a, a division of ESCOM that focuses on the generation of electricity for the entire continent. Yeah. Because currently, the subcontinent doesn't have electricity. So this side of the Sahara Desert, there's no electricity. And you mean sub-Sahara? Sub-Sahara, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. The sub-Saharan continent, uh, South Africa doesn't have electricity. I mean, like, DRC has got a population which is far much bigger than South Africa. It's mm. special in terms of space as well. Mm. It's bigger than, than um, South Africa. But the entire electricity that is generated and used in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, is less than what Gauteng consumes, Gauteng mm. province only. And there's a huge scope to could capacitate ESCOM to could generate. It's in the founding manifesto as well of the EFF that mm -hmm. part of our project should be to earn additional revenue from expanding the infrastructure that ESCOM has to generate electricity, but to also invest in transmission. And of course, people are going to say, yeah, we're failing to electrify South Africa now. How about the continent? We will be able to stabilize the supply of electricity mm -hmm. in South Africa with a view of forming strategic equity partnerships with capable state-owned companies from China yeah. to then expand the transmission capacity. I mean, I mean, like, I'm, 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 I'm sure if we take a decision, which we will take as government, that at least every year, let us build an additional 20,000 kilometers of high-voltage transmission lines into the continent that is going to lead to collective prosperity for the entire continent because currently there is no transmission capacity even in areas where electricity can be easily generated in with the potential of the Inga Dam and the DRC. We still need transmission investments mm. that are going to... And, and we can play a central role in terms of that. And the financing of that, by the way, to do that, there's a lot of money in South Africa and we can still even tap into other resources from elsewhere. Okay, let's go to the fourth instrument. Yes. of uh, expanding revenue. The fourth instrument is actually on the asset prescription. Mm -hmm. So asset prescription, like when I say, talks about, we talk about uh, prescribed assets. So outside of the National Revenue Fund, which we say is two trillion now, mm -hmm. and, and that is the revenue is two trillion, but the budget of government is 2.3. Meaning that they must go to the market to borrow additional resources mm -hmm. to cover all the government obligations that are needed in this mm -hmm. financial year. So then we spoke to um, the first aspect is avoidance, like tax avoidance issues would deal, deal with, mm -hmm. giving the local state the capacity. Now, the first one was maximal collection. Yes, maximal collection of yeah. taxes, yes, yes. To deal, obviously, dealing with tax avoidance as mm -hmm. well. Then the second one is the local state yes. being capacitated. And then then the, uh, the third SOEs. one is SOEs. Mm -hmm. Like all of them that they must be, including AXA, by the way, mm -hmm. like the airports company in South Africa, South Go Cold, build airports. The, yes, go and build mm -hmm. airports in the in the continent. And then asset uh, prescription. Then then the four is asset prescription. Mm -hmm. Now, now this is an interesting yes. uh, component that so Outside of the National Revenue Fund, which we are talking about, we have in South Africa currently 7.8 trillion rands of pension funds, like mm -hmm. pension months. And then the biggest component of that is the Government Employees Pension Fund, 
which is uh, GPF. Mm. And then you have got the ESCOM pension fund. Uh, so the GPF is actually at 2.3 trillion mm -hmm. of pension funds. And then the, the ESCOM pension fund, the Transnet pension funds, there's a variety of pension funds, including for municipalities. Mm -hmm. So we actually had said that part of what we need to do is to merge all the pension funds of all the municipalities in South Africa into one municipal employees pension fund, which mm -hmm. will possibly be similar or half the size of the a government employees pension fund. And how do pension funds get to play a role in an economy or in society? So pension funds appoint asset management companies. Mm -hmm. So these privately owned asset management companies like Coronation, Old Mutra, mm -hmm. and all sorts of things. There's even black owned one. There's uh, the black owned one called Mazu Capital, mm -hmm. and a variety of other asset management companies which take those pension funds and go and invest them in private equity, which is businesses which are not listed in the stock exchanges. Mm -hmm. And then when they get profit, then they take the dividends back to the pension fund. And then, but the major area of investments of pension funds happens in the listed space of companies that are listed in the Johannesburg mm -hmm. Stock Exchange, in the London Stock Exchange, and other areas as New well. York, stock exchanges, yeah. New York Stock Exchange. So, what has been happening thus far is that these asset management companies have been taking pension funds and listing in and and investing in the listed stock mm -hmm. or in listed companies. <clears throat> they, of course, have huge returns and revenue that they generate out of that, but it doesn't expand economic activity domestically. I must mention that the government employees pension fund, which is 2.3 trillion, mm -hmm. the asset management company is the public investment corporation, which is wholly state owned. It's owned by government. It actually manages assets upward of 2.3 trillion rands. 80% of that, if not more, is on the listed stock. So the PIC has got partial ownership of uh, NARSPAS, mm. of PROSAS, of uh, almost all the major banks and mm -hmm. Anglo-American and all of those things. Whenever they get dividends, they, um, they then take it back to the GPF as part of that. But it is permissible in history and in economic theory and practice of how fiscal policy can be utilized, mm -hmm. that a pension fund can have a mandate to invest in the productive economy. In industry. In industry. Mm -hmm. In infrastructure as mm -hmm. well. Like, because infrastructure can be labor absorbed. Well, public infrastructure. Public infrastructure, yeah. like major public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that is what we need to prescribe. We should have a prescription as to just where should the pension funds be invested? Mm -hmm. It's not an anomaly in the case of South Africa. I don't want to mention the period between 1958 and 1989 where the apartheid government was utilizing the pension funds to grow most of these state-owned companies which they built mm -hmm. for the protection of the white minority, for the creation of jobs for the white minority. But almost everywhere in the world, the pension funds are strategically utilized to stimulate economic activity and economic growth. And we believe that because that is dead man. Actually, like uh, I was I was reading somewhere of this in Capital Volume 3 on public debt by Karl Marx. He says that dead money must always be brought into action. So that is dead money. Like I mean to have two trillion which is not doing anything. Mm. What is the purpose of that? Seven point eight trillion in total actually. Mm -hmm. So must inject life into that dead money and give it life so in a manner that is going to expand economic activity. And as a return, it is going to expand the revenue base upon which the state Let's is going to collect. Let's be a bit more uh, pragmatic or practical. Yes. yes. What you're saying is you will pass regulations that that money must be invested in uh, companies or in businesses that are Labor absorptive. Labor absorptive, but that are also building public infrastructure. So if, for instance, we uh, have a project of building a train from Deben to Musina, yes. the companies that are participating in that activity, PIC, should invest there. Yes. All right. Yeah, that is basically... And that, that, I mean, like, that actually, expands and your revenue. Yes. Because... 
you have to as government build public infrastructure. Yes. All right. I mean like if if I mean like I know that there was a, there's a proposal from the Chinese government that they they, are, they can actually get the Chinese state owned companies to mm-hmm. build the highest build the rail from Deben to inland mm-hmm. of South Africa for the transportation of goods and people as well. Mm-hmm. That could be one of the major contributors to the economy and mm-hmm. that 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 has to be dealt with um, South of Africa's course with capital is a very strange capital i mean uh, over the, over this past uh, easter weekend there's been so many roads accident because literally south africa's transport yeah. infrastructure is under is yeah. is overwhelmed rather because it's underdeveloped yes and there's no over the past 30 years yes. except the the how train which is really less than possibly 2%. It resolves 2% of the traffic volumes on our roads. There's no proper investment. I think 0.5%. 0.5%. <laughs> There's no investment because in a... And that would that, the quicken sizes, the economy. The sizes of how train the, the coach is, is like the uh, same size of a bus and everything. Yeah. So there isn't... South Africa's <laughs> capital has to be... Literally through the uh, asset ma- uh, asset management or asset cr- uh, prescription, yes. it has to be regulated to go to the activities that actually develop South Africa. That develops South Africa's All right. economy. Let's and go then, to the last one. The last one, and then and, and then the the other aspect as well. I want us to talk about the the, the BOTs as well immediately after that. The the last one is that we should create a sovereign wealth fund. Mm-hmm. We have made this submission and we have even made a far much more substantial policy submission mm-hmm. as to what should constitute a sovereign wealth fund in South Africa. So out of the royalties that are earned from the mineral resources and other business activities, let us constitute a sovereign wealth fund. They mm-hmm. are very successful sovereign wealth funds in the world. I think one which has exceeded a trillion dollars mm-hmm. is the Norwegian government a sovereign wealth fund. Mm-hmm which primarily benefits out of the natural resources, particularly oil in Norway, it plays a very important role in protection, and actually in provision of basic social protection services, quality education, healthcare, mm-hmm. and all of those that are needed. And then you've got a lot of sovereign wealth funds um, in, in the Middle East, like the, in Saudi Arabia, I think mm-hmm. it's called the Public Investment Corporation as well. Mm-hmm. And um, what is and all of those? Fund? So a sovereign a wealth fund. So a sovereign definition. wealth fund. Yeah, a sovereign wealth fund is like a holding company that so you create a company mm-hmm. kind of which deals with investments, which is going to not just manage pension fund, not manage pension funds. Mm-hmm. It gets startup capital. It gets money from the natural resources. It then makes strategic investments, not only in South Africa but all over the world. There's a mm-hmm. lot of money to be earned all over the world. If you see that this project, like if you get proper investment financiers and practitioners, they can go and earn South Africa a lot of money in the world. If mm-hmm. you were to check the Qatar Sovereign Wealth Fund, they've got investments all over the world, by the way. Like they earn money from the activities, economic activities that are happening in America, in Western Europe, in China. Similar to the China's Investment Corporation. So we need some instrument there in South Africa which is going to not only go and make mm-hmm. money outside of South Africa, but must also attract other industrial uh, investors into the South African economy to say that if you come to South Africa to invest a billion rand, we are going to match rent for rent as the sovereign wealth fund. And that can actually encourage a lot of investors because investors sometimes like the the in, in terms of how this gets to work they become worried of just saying you no know, just come and spend the entirety of your money without some security that is guaranteed domestically so a sovereign wealth fund can play a much more significant and that role. will expand revenue that will expand two, revenue two, as two, well two things before we go to monetary policy and i want to talk to uh, you to yeah. yeah but i wanted us to start with uh, part of what the manifesto speaks about is wealth tax. Can you take us through, because there is currently no wealth tax in South Africa. Yes, I think that as part of the tax categories that mm-hmm. we currently have, we need to impose a wealth tax. How would it work? Super rich. 
So who can then quantify yeah, that possibly was just three families you'd be texting, <laughs> you know? Seven maybe. So so that will be the You can actually ma- like literally <laughs> mention them. Open so the open open the uh, yeah. that uh the Motor, guy. Eh? Ten cent guy. Goes back. Yeah. yeah, maybe Mutzebe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy who owns Cape Tech as well. Like uh, all of the those. Ackermans. Yeah. yeah, the Ackermans own P and P and yes. all of those. Like, so, but, but they what, have to what, pay. what? What? What is the because, you know, a wealth tax? And could you put it as well in percentile terms? Sure. What would be percentile? And those who pay wealth tax would they still be paying um, corporate income tax? So you know what 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 yeah they must pay corporate income tax. So what you tax the wealth tax that you you impose is on wealth that is hoarded, mm-hmm. like which like when people have got dead money, they've got barren money, like mm. got trillions of rands. Why do you keep like four, five, six, seven billion rand in a bank in the account bank, just sitting there? Yeah, what is the purpose of that? And you do not want to get it into activity, mm. which they've got option to could get that money into activity. So we must then say so that the wealth we, tax is going to force people to put money in into, circulation, into, into circulation, yes. and, and then uh, that, instead of keeping it in the bank, that increases economic activity naturally. So if they don't do that, we then say we want a portion of it so that we can bring it into activity as yeah. government. We're going to. Uh, okay. Make sure that we build schools, we build better much, roads, and all of those. How much do you think we could raise from a wealth tax? We can be able to estimate just how much um, wealth is in the hands of these few individuals. Mm. Like, if the estimation, like a proper proven record, that three human beings, like the three richest human beings in South Africa, are richer than uh, 26 million people, mm-hmm. you can just know just just how much we can get out of that. But it, it will be a substantial component of money which can be utilized for productive do you, I mean, purposes. The percentage, what do you have in, what do we have in I mind? Think, in I think, I terms, think, it would be what of their wealth? I, 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 I think we can work more or less on the same rates as we do with corporate income tax. 20... Yeah, 20% six. towards 45%. <laughs> so that is... By, by yeah. the way, do you know, it's... Do you know apartheid government used to tax the mines 70%? 80. 70 to 80, yeah. yes. They, they were... They yeah. were Corporate income tax. Yeah, corporate income tax In was... In fact, was, the first proposal was nationalization. Yes, and, and then, then they, they said, they, no, they, they dropped at 80% of the profits, yeah. Yeah, they used okay. to take as much as that. So, And they were able to then derive some value for white people only mm. out of that particular activity in terms of what got to happen. All right. And then there is obviously the BOTs, Build, Operate, and Transfer model. uh, model. Uh, It's not quite directly related to the expansion of revenue. Yeah, but it's... Uh, But it's one of the mechanisms that you... I the manifesto dialect- speaks to... Yes. Yeah. I think dialectically it can have... Dialectically. <laughs> it will have some relationship with the expansion of because, the revenue Because it will relieve the state. It will relieve the state. Ex- yes. state ex- will, uh, but let's just explain yeah. what that yeah. is. Yeah. BOT. Yeah. yeah. So build, operate, transfer is like... It's, it's, a, it's a method of how you develop infrastructure. So in a situation where you do not have the money as government to could build a rail project from Musina to Cape Town, mm-hmm. high speed rail, you can contract a capable company which says that we're going to build this on your behalf and then we operate it for a period of 20 years. We know that the revenue that we're going to generate in the 20 years period would have covered what we spent to build the infrastructure. And after 20 years, we hand it over to you as government to, to full ownership. So it's called build, operate, then transfer. So there is a lot of countries in the world, even in the African continent, which are opting for BOTs as a means and mechanism for infrastructure development. I actually know this. I actually got to pay closer attention to this when we visited uh, Accra, Ghana, mm. uh, as part of... Uh, the parliamentary delegation, as, as chief whips, that was possibly like seven, six, seven years ago. And then we, we said to the Minister of Roads and Highways, and then we asked him, how much budget do you have in, in the Department of Roads and Highways? He says, zero. Mm. But 
um, were busy doing 12, 14 projects, mega projects, like fiscally neutral without having expending any cent on it because they were able to contract companies that have got money to build for them, major highways, airports, revamps, and all of those. And then with the aim that later on they will hand it over to the state because the state doesn't currently have money. But also if you were to check the major infrastructure programs and projects that are taking place in the continent, in Ethiopia, in Nigeria, like hydroelectric power stations mm -hmm. in Angola, <laughs> in Zambia, and in a variety of other countries, the, the mostly the Chinese state-owned companies are willing to enter into BOTs or, or, or enter into some degree of concessional loans uh, that also even got to define um, the major uh, rail project. Let's, let's call it the standard gauge rail, uh, railway in Kenya between Nairobi and Mombasa. Uh, I think in the other uh, podcast we mentioned between Djibouti and Ethiopia. Actually, the, the Djibouti to the Addis Ababa to to Djibouti. Djibouti is a country mm -hmm. which is coastal next to mm -hmm. Ethiopia. So Ethiopia is fully landlocked, by the way. Mm. But it has got the fastest growing economy in the continent now, mm. at average of 10% in the past 10, 15 yes. years. Because there's industry, but for them to have meaningful uh, economic activities, they need the ports to mm. export. So, yes. So then the Chinese, in collaboration with the Chinese government and Chinese state-owned companies do able to build about 758 kilometers mm -hmm. of rail, high-speed rail, efficient project that moves from Addis Ababa to the port of Djibouti, uh, which is a which is actually which actually got to to contribute significantly mm -hmm. to economic activities of Ethiopia and 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 also get to even expand industries because they know that we have got a route to could export whatever we're producing here even from the manufacturing, manufacturing point of view. So we need, as South Africa, I know that rhetorically, I think they had picked up some of the police submissions that we had made. Rhetorically, these ones of the ANC, I think that the Ramaphosa was saying, we're going to look into BOTs. I think it's in that state of nation address which they banned us from attending. Mm -hmm. They mentioned BOTs, but there's never been any meaningful and impactful beauty in South Africa. Just the controversial uh, pushback. Yeah. I mean, the descripti description of uh, the, the money, the dead money in South Africa is in trillions of rands. Yes. And possibly a closer investigation may even find one held in tax havens may even be more. Yes. Uh, if South Africa seriously implements the first four instruments, well, all the five instruments of yes. revenue base, you seem to be going towards a situation where you have enough money, not only for South Africa, but to, for you to do BOTs in the continent. In the continent, yeah. For you to do, I mean, you, you and, possibly a, don't need for and, infrastructure and, development yes. a, a BOT from China or... Uh, yes. A BOT from Russia and all of that. You possibly can Have with the money of the, the South Africa's capacity. I mean, uh, am I correct that yeah. uh, Actually, if we the, if we did the, the, the first five aggressively, yes. Actually, you may actually have enough money not to rely for aggressive mega infrastructure projects on anyone outside. Yes. Actually, do you know the... What you're saying dovetails what is in the founding manifesto of the EFF on the development of the African economy. Mm. One of the cardinal pillars yes. for economic freedom in our lifetime. It, it actually specifies that in the development of the African economy, that South African state-owned companies and must have the must build the necessary capacity to could invest in the infrastructure upliftment and development of the entire mm -hmm. African continent. And that is properly detailed as well in the manifesto. Yeah. So if we then get to have to expand our revenue basis and we've got surpluses, we should have a continental vision as to mm. just how do we collectively develop uh, ourselves. It, it, it will be folly, it will be foolishness mm. to think that the development of South Africa must happen for its own sake with, without paying attention as to what happens in the subcontinent, in the entire sub-Saharan uh, 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 continent. 
so that we are able to, to collectively prosper. We have been stratified in a far much more significant, significant way, such that the standard gauge railway or the, the, the standard the, the gauge for rail projects is mm. not similar in the African continent that they made it impossible for us to could integrate our rail projects. Mm. We need to pursue that to integrate mm. all our rail because projects. Because there's a lot of money to be made yes. by South Africa from Africa. Yes, and then we integrate the yeah. entire continent in terms of infrastructure because now all the rail projects are moving from inland of each and every country to the sea mm. because they want to steal, they want to continue to steal our natural resources. Mm. But if we were to integrate the transport infrastructure, highways, roads, everything else there, there could be a we're going to qualitatively and quantitatively expand the intra-African trade, which is essential for common prosperity and common growth. It mm -hmm. will then deal with these issues which people complain about every day of migration because once there is economic activity in all parts of the African... No one needs to leave, no, no one needs to leave where yes. they are for economic reasons. DP, let's go to uh, the instruments for the control of money circulation, supply of money, the protection of the value yes. of the currency, and that linked to economic growth, monetary policy. Uh, you explained earlier what monetary policy yes. is and how has it been uh, uh, the case in South Africa. But just for refreshing people's minds, what is what has been South Africa's monetary uh, policy and what is its diagnosis over the last 30 years? Look, the, the, you know, we did say that the constitution obliges the South African Reserve Bank to protect the currency or the value of the currency in pursuit of economic growth and development. Mm -hmm. But it looks like the successive governors of the South African Reserve Bank from Crystals, Titomboweni, uh, what is the other governor who came after Titomboweni? Uh, the former deputy minister of finance, the, the female, mm -hmm. and then Lisicha. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all of them, they seem to have put a full stop on the protection of the currency value. Like mm. So their major focus has just solely been inflation targeting. Mm. They've only been saying that, no, there must not be, that has been the main focus. There's never been any concerted effort mm. on the protection of the economy, on driving economic growth through a... Yeah, I but mean, also, I think you I can think take the, 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 yeah. the public into confidence because the, the EFF did meet yes, with the, uh, the senior Reserve executive Bank. of the South African Reserve Bank. And, and provided the critic that yeah. they have not played the, any significant role in, in the growing the economy. The growing the and economy. they have not denied it. They have not denied it. Mm. Like their obsession has been to deal with the balance of payments and the national payment systems mm. and printing money and mm. all of those things and bank regulation. But in terms of contributing much more meaningfully to economic growth, and even to diversification of those who own and control financial institutions, mm -hmm. the South African Reserve Bank has not played a meaningful How would the EFF them? then take the management of monetary policy to the next step after the full stop <laughs> to economic growth? How would you use no, because, monetary you know, policy yeah, for economic development? Despite this autonomy, which is over emphasized of the central bank, the constitution, by the way, says that the ministry responsible for the finances of uh, the country should constantly have engagement with the central bank to guide it on some of the issues. I think there has to be alignment to the country's economic objectives. If our pursuit is industrialization, monetary policy must follow that direction. How, how would in it terms of like the, the manner in which the currency is tagged mm -hmm. or pegged Mm -hmm. must be reflective that we are now a, a, an economy that is now focusing on industrialization. And also the form of industrialization that are going to be in pursuit of, whether it's inward industrialization, you know, export-led and everything else. They like. There are so many aspects that must be looked into. So the monetary policy must always be aligned to, um, to, to the economic activities that 
are, are being pursued. Mm -hmm. And that is that is essentially what a, a central bank should be directed to do. And we unapologetically should not fold our arms and say there is going to be autonomy of a central bank which is not aligned with the economic aspirations of uh, the nation as a whole. So mm -hmm. those must be guided so that we collectively... So I'm, I'm, I'm the reserve never... bank governor. What instruments must I use uh, when it comes to the usage of monetary policy or the control of so the, money the, towards industrial development? So what, what would the governor or the reserve bank practically so the, have to do? So... If you have constant engagement with industry, like say like the biggest sector of your economy is manufacturing, mm -hmm. and then you have a meaningful economic discussion with the manufacturing sector, they will mm -hmm. say to you that the interest rates that you are putting are prohibitive for us to trade externally mm -hmm. or to borrow money, mm -hmm. to expand our companies and all of those other things. Then the interest rates must be tagged differently. It mm -hmm. is solely the responsibility of the South African Reserve Bank's Monetary Policy Committee mm -hmm. to set interest rates. So it's favor. a decision. It's <clears throat> not It's not some science. It's not some machine that calculates. It's a decision of human beings that we're going to keep to keep these interest rates at this level for, for whatever reasons that they're doing so. Mm -hmm. And in most instances, they do interest rates to in South Africa to limit the flow of money because... They, they they think that there will be inflation which is not uh, contained. But sometimes to pursue a macroeconomic policy, that the uh, monetary policy that focuses on the increasing the supply of money mm -hmm. can have huge economic benefits in terms of job creation, but also in terms of how uh, you get to have as many people as possible participate in meaningful economic activities. So that, that has to be guided in a much more meaningful way. But the other thing which is important, I think, which we should, South Africa, drift towards now because of uh, the global balance of forces. Mm -hmm. We should trade more with friendly forces. We should trade more with China, with Brazil, with Russia, with Saudi Arabia now, with Ethiopia, uh, with the Egypt, with the countries that are now coming into the BRICS block. Mm -hmm. Because, do you know, the end of colonization did not end colonialism and neocolonialism. So these countries in the West, they always have neocolonial aspirations and intentions whenever we trade with them. Whenever you do business with the U.S., or the Western Europe countries, they always want to prescribe to you what you must do. They mm. do it directly, or they utilize their puppet institutions like the World Bank and the IMF to determine your economic policy direction. But also now they are even in invading the energy policy direction mm. because it is not wholly South African direction, like solution to want to decommission coal power, coal stations. power stations. It's an instruction from Joe Biden. Actually, you remember in the conference of parties, this COP27, mm -hmm. Joe Biden is the one who actually announced that South Africa is going to start closing coal power stations before even the Minister of Mineral Resources was aware. <laughs> even before the Minister of Energy and South Africa was aware, Joe Biden was announcing that South Africa is going to close, to decommission coal power stations. Mm -hmm. So we need to purposefully increase our component and share of trade globally with the friendly forces, uh, those that do not have neo-colonial intentions in terms of how we're going to read with them. And that inevitably will form part of the insulation of the currency of South Africa. So, like the protection of the rand. Mm -hmm. uh, because the value the, of the Yeah, rand. the value of the rand. Because they, these liberals are alleging that we are going to lose the value of the rent when we take over government. It is not going to happen. We're going to have a very stable currency whose value is going to be aligned to the economic aspirations and plans of the country at any given moment. Yeah, I, 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 that's where I was going because I think there must be a much more patient explanation of when an international economic backlash occurs because 
of the policies the EFF adopts. Just mm. the basic Rui uh, Russia went through the same thing, experienced huge amounts of capital flight uh, in the first phase just uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then most recently with the Ukraine conflict. If the EFF government takes over and there is a Van Royen, the de, de, Des Van Royen reaction to the EFF uh, and capital literally facilitates the devaluing of the rent, but also we experience capital flight. Because you said earlier already, yeah, they keep trillions and trillions of rents yeah, in the yeah. system. So at the click of a button... Uh, about four or five trillion rands in South Africa's economic can live. I, what would be the... That's what it's being alleged. Yeah. What would be a mechanism uh, in relation to the EFF to deal with that situation? Yeah, I. you know, like the current the obtaining economic conditions of South Africa, I don't think there's a scope to could bully South Africa through the currency in a way that will wholly collapse the economy. Mm-hmm. One of the major factors, by the way, is South Africa's biggest trading partner now, both imports, exports, and is the People's Republic of China. Mm-hmm. And the other role players are coming in as well. So like the Western agenda, in which are the ones who bully uh, like the less developed or uh, developing economies into submission, I don't think that they would even go to that direction. Also, I don't think that there's anyone rational in the entire world who would think that the EFF as government is going to destroy the economy. We, if anything, are going to expand South Africa's economy in a manner that is sustainable. Mm-hmm. And we will, of course, take lessons from the Russian Federation in terms of building internal mechanisms and having the economy anchored domestically mm-hmm. so that we are not threatened by all these uh, other players. And remember that at the core of the imperialist interest in South African economy is the natural resources. Mm. So capital flight is not easy. It's not something you can just say that, why won't you fly to? Fly to where? Like, the minerals are here. The iron ore is here. The gas potential is here as well that is needed. Like It's like, it's real economic activity. It's not some fictitious capital which you can just click a button and you say that I'm out of there. It's real economic activities. So the uh, I don't think we're that vulnerable, like in terms of what got to happen. And the the I think also what has to protect the entire economy is the conduct as well of the political leadership and those who are leading uh, everywhere else. So you see, the reason why they could easily enter Zimbabwe and ravage it and savage it in a huge way, uh, its currency, is because a substantial number of its political leadership was very compromised. Like, and traceably, how? traceably compromised in terms of the uh, their own personal dealings mm-hmm. with money movements and everything else. Because once money gets into the banking system, these imperialists know how much we has got what and everything is where the money is. So they could see that, but this money of Zimbabwe is just moving in the accounts of politicians. Mm. Millions, and they, they've not ended legitimately and everything else. That is why when they did the sanctions in the beginning, they did targeted sanctions mm. to target individuals that you and you and you and you and you cannot have any trade with us mm. in terms of what happens. So if there is proper integrity amongst the leadership uh, at a political level and and everyone else involved, including public officials, we are well insulated. And, and of course, working with our friends uh, in the BRICS block, mm. we are far much more insulated from the threat of a devalued currency. We, are, we, 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 we If anything, we're going to thrive and have... So they are, far much the long overdue economic prosperity. It the it's yeah, just, it's yeah, it's a phobia. Like a that is fighters. yeah, that is what they do all like, all the all the time. Even even 1994, like they they used to say the same thing. Like in fact, there were they used to say the, the same thing. Capital flight DP between 
94 and 96. Hey, 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 this Significant uh, big not- companies went to register in the London Stock of Exchange, taking advantage of the opening up. So it actually, isn't it that our mineral industrial do you know, complex... Do you, know, do, you know that the, <laughs> do you know in the... And that did lead the, to the weakening no, of the value of the rent. No, I didn't. Okay. Do you know that the... The the ceremony in which they perform in the New York Stock Exchange when they list a new company, mm-hmm. they ring a bell there. Mm-hmm. You must guess who rang the first bell when the first South African company went to list in the New York, New York Stock Exchange. Mm-hmm. It was former President Nelson Mandela. Mm-hmm. So they collaborated. They thought naively that as part of global integration, we must take South African companies to law to list in the New York Stock Exchange and London Stock Exchange and all of those things there. I don't think it was not only capital flight in the sense that someone says, I'm going to uproot my factory and go and plug it elsewhere. That, I think, is the capital flight we must be scared of. And that so that two, one, and two, that one, two, 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 that one is happening. Let's emphasize a bit there. I think yeah. it's an important point. Yeah. Um, we've got capital in a, in a, in a form of Fictitious, fictitious money. Yes. Yeah. Then there is capital in the form of factories, in the form of uh, actual uh, activity, mines, economic activity. Uh, yes. And then, uh, how should I call this? Let's say a company that is in the service sector, which yes. is a call center or whatever. So you're saying that the capital flight that we should worry about is where somebody closes a gold mine. And go open the gold mine elsewhere. But Barlow World can uh, can say we're going to leave and go operate in yeah, Ethiopia. The major, the major, the major industrial and manufacturing mm-hmm. investors, which can leave. But by, by the way, there some are beginning to scale down their operations of Africa due to electricity shortages. Mm. So that is happening now. Like that is what we have to then deal with. Mm. I don't think that for political reasons mm-hmm. there would be a manufacturer who will say, I'm picking up, I'm leaving because uh, the EFF has been elected into power. Mm-hmm. Because I I don't I have never seen in any manifesto of the EFF anywhere where it says we're going to expropriate without compensation the factories mm-hmm. of people who are involved in manufacturing. If anything, we're going to make sure that these uh, additional South African-owned manufacturing companies that coexist with whoever came from China, from wherever they came from, mm-hmm. to invest in the industrial component of the economy. So we we have not said in the manifestos of the EFF yeah. that we're going to expropriate without compensation the manufacturing investors who are creating jobs for our people. If anything... We want to expand the scope of investments in the manufacturing sector in a manner that is much more sustainable and will benefit our people so that we have got adequate revenue base Mm -hmm. to pay for the social grants, which we said we are going to double and we will double, Mm -hmm. to pay for the fee-free education, which we said must be provided Mm -hmm. until people have got the degrees that they need Mm -hmm. or the qualifications that they need everywhere. So those those commitments are solid and they are backed by sound economic principles which are going to make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. I think that is where we are. Well, that's the uh, EFF's fiscal and monetary policy. Thank you very much, DP. Very insightful. I just have to remind you that this is the 2024 elections manifesto of the EFF which we present to the people of South Africa as the substantial reason why EFF is the true alternative. So please vote EFF on the 29th of May. Thank you, DP. No, thank you very much. And then, of course, people must not make a mistake and vote for clownish parties. They must vote for the economic emancipation movement. We're the only organization that knows what we're doing Mm -hmm. and we're ready to take over South Africa to proper prosperity that is durable and sustainable. So let us, all of us, go and vote for the economic freedom fighters on the 29th of May so that we have a new trajectory of a, an economy that qualitatively and quantitatively expand to look after all of us. Thank you.